when we think about what makes up our bodies, each of us consists of about 30 trillion human cells, according to the latest numbers. But we have about 39 trillion microbial cells. And so it's by that measure that we're about 43% human. Now you might be thinking, well wait, it's not really our cells that make us human so much as our genes, our DNA. So let's think about that for a moment. Each of us has about 20,000 human genes, but the size of our microbial gene catalog ranges from 2 to 20 million microbial genes. And so by that measure, we're at best 1% human. And this is, this is pretty fascinating when you think about systems biology. You've probably heard about all the enthusiasm for systems biology and for precision medicine. And it's pretty difficult to do systems biology if you're ignoring 99% of that system, which is what we do when we ignore the, you know, the genes that are in our microbiome. So, um, so this idea that we, uh, so, so genes are only part of our system, and the idea that we are what we eat is certainly not a new idea. And there's this wonderful quote from Jeff Bland, who, uh, who likes to say that food is a language that speaks to our genes. So, uh, so, so our genes are fixed, but what those genes do afterwards depends a lot on, uh, on what our food is saying to them. And in large part, this language is a language of color. So uh, all of the brightly colored foods that we eat have different compounds in them, like the lycopenoids in the tomatoes, the, car uh, the carotenoids in the carrots, uh, the anthocyanins in the blueberries, and so forth. And so there's this amazing language of color uh, that the diets we've co-evolved with use to speak to our genes. Um, of course, today uh, we've lost a lot of the connections to that language. So, uh, regrettably, instead of this kind of thing, um, when, uh, when, when my four-year-old goes a few blocks from our house uh, to the local corner store, what she sees is this instead. And, uh, you know, she'll look at that rack and she'll, uh, she, she's very polite, she'll say, uh, 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 she'll, she'll say, Daddy, you know, you always tell us that we should eat a lot of brightly colored foods, and so, please may I have some Cheetos. And, Unfortunately, the response was not quite so polite as the question usually. But, uh, but, but, uh, but the artificial substitutes that we have for this natural language of color that our food is trying to speak to us in um, is, 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 is no real substitute for, the, uh, for what we're missing out by severing that connection. Now, when we think about, uh, when we think about our genes, um, often there's this idea of essentialism and uh, that our genes control a lot of stuff about us. And it is true uh, that genes have a very important influence on our health. Um, on the other hand, a lot of the genes that have that influence are microbial. And so, for example, today I can tell you with 90% accuracy whether you're lean or obese, based solely on the DNA of the microbes in your gut. So on the one hand, this is a cool trick from a technical perspective. On the other hand, we don't think it has a lot of commercial potential as a test for obesity, because I bet you can tell which of these people is obese, knowing absolutely nothing about their microbes. But if we try to do that same prediction task, lean or obese, based on the human genome, we can only do that with 58% accuracy, knowing all of the sequences of all of your human genes, versus 90% accuracy based on your microbial genes. So the microbes are definitely doing something there. And uh, we can prove that they're actually doing that by turning to experiments in mice. And so uh, in work with Jeffrey uh, Gordon at, the Was uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, we were able to show that you can actually take the microbes from an obese person and then transfer them to mice raised in a bubble with absolutely no microbes of their own. And when you do that, you get a fat mouse. But that's not true if you instead transfer the microbes from a lean person. And what's amazing about this is that we could even design a synthetic microbial community based on the microbes of the lean person that prevent the mice from gaining that weight. Uh, so, so this is amazing, and other researchers have shown that you can do the same kind of thing for all kinds of other conditions that you might not have expected, including even, uh, even psychological traits. So you can, make a mal uh, you can make a bold mouse timid or a timid mouse bold by swapping its microbes from another sort of mouse that normally does something different. Um.